Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. Um, just I need to plug in this into, where's the adapter for? Okay, very good. Perfect. Uh, is there a light? There you go. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the warm introduction and the warm welcome. Um, I, uh, many years ago when I did my uh, third year clerkship in uh, surgery and I um, enjoyed it immensely, it uh, has uh, so many memories and so many um, exciting moments, I um, really fondly look back on that time. Um, anyway, uh, let me get started. Okay, um, just I think um, I'm going to give you guys a very didactic lecture that's going to start out with an overview of some of the history, and then I'm going to switch into some more recent findings. Um, uh, basically, uh, the, the early slides are probably the most important slides, and the later ones probably get into the weeds a little bit, but uh, please pardon me, that's what I do every day. Uh, and so um, the, the, the first thing is just to give you a basic overview here, um, which is the tumor suppressor P10. What is it? What, what are we talking about here? And basically, um, uh, oh yeah, here we go. Um, it's, uh, the name P10 comes from the fact that it has a phosphatase domain, uh, and it is homologous to a protein called tensin, which is found at focal adhesions on the inner surface of the cell uh, uh, membrane, uh, and also um, that it's uh, on chromosome 10, so it's deleted on chromosome 10. This gene is really uh, lost in, in really pretty much every kind of cancer at some frequency. Um, with very high frequency um, uh, 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 losses and mutations occurring in endometrial, prostate, breast, melanoma, small cell lung cancer, and glioblastoma. Um, but that's just a, a partial list. Um, uh, in fact, you know, colon, it's lost probably about 12% about of colon cancer. Um, and because uh, uh, I was hearing about the, uh, the bowel recently. Uh, and germline mutations um, are associated with hamartoma syndromes and also abnormal tissue organization syndromes, uh, and, and, and in fact also autism. So uh, there's, there's a Lamite de Clos syndrome, which is associated with cerebellar malfunction, which is associated with mutations in P10, and autist, autism, uh, there's clearly examples. Uh, although it's not deterministic, you can have um, mutations in the germline that are not associated with autism. And then lastly, uh, as you would infer from the homology, a P10 encodes a phosphatase enzyme that actually antagonizes a very important signaling pathway in the cell called the PI3 kinase signaling pathway via the fact that it's not just a protein phosphatase, or it's a lipid phosphatase. It, ha it has protein phosphatase activity, in fact, but probably its most important substrate is, is its lipid phosphate substrate. And um, the way uh, you can see, it's a very simple protein. It's 403 amino acids. Um, it's expressed in all cells in the body. And uh, it has a phosphatase region that sort of about half of it. It has a C2 domain, which is important for membrane binding. And it has a regulatory tail and PDZ binding region at the very end uh, that's just about 53 amino acids long. So that gives you kind of the overview, uh, uh, sort of the big picture of what we're talking about. To put it in context, what is this PI3 kinase pathway? Well, shown here um, is an example. Uh, you can see. Um, here is PI3 kinase, uh, which stands for phosphatidyl or phosphoinositide 3, 4, 5, uh, uh, 3 kinase, I'm sorry. Uh, and and um, basically what you can see here is typically it's not on until it's activated by receptor tyrosine kinases. Uh, it can also be activated by the RAS uh, protein. And this leads to this inner leaflet, uh, inner, mem uh, inner side of the surface of the plasma membrane, uh, uh, phosphatidyl inositol unit being phosphorylated on the 3 position. And this acts as a second messenger that recruits lots of different proteins to the membrane. And it actually, uh, the reason why it's such a potent uh, cancer uh, pathway is these signals can regulate cell proliferation, um, cell death, cell migration, metabolism, and also uh, regulate tumor microenvironment. This pathway can activate VEGF expression, for instance. Um, uh, anyway, P10 as a phosphatase that turns this signal off makes sense. Uh, as, as, as a, uh, a break on the system. 
Uh, and th then we've uh, also talked a little bit about PREX2, which we found recently is an inhibitor of P10 that can be overexpressed in, uh, in different kinds of cancer and, and, and uh, basically inhibit P10 and therefore activate the signal. Um, the other thing I want to point out that's important about this slide is in cancer, there are all these different genes that I'm talking about here, uh, upstream particularly, have been shown to be mutated at high frequency in different kinds of human cancer. So this pathway is used over and over again um, in different settings, um, in the prostate, in breast, in colon, um, uh, in, in lung cancer, uh, to activate um, this signal to, th that has this uh, untoward effect, this unregulated proliferation and uh, me cellular metabolism with the main, you know, main metabolic output being uh, increased glucose uptake, um, but also uh, increased glucose metabolism and also probably glutamine metabolism. But anyway, uh, the story starts here in 1984 when um, Daryl Bigner's group at Duke University uh, was doing karyotyping of glioblastoma multiforme. And they noticed a very interesting pattern, and that is, uh, um, shown here, let me get rid of this because I keep grabbing the wrong pointer. You can see chromosome 10, one copy is missing. And this was seen over and over again uh, in, in a, a set, many different cases of independently uh, um, d uh, 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 cultured samples of, of GBM. And based on this, he published this paper in, uh, in 1984. And, and so um, Several people, were, were, several groups around the uh, country were on the hunt for a gene on chromosome 10 involved in glioblastoma. So my group started looking for it as well, and we basically found this, the locus that was responsible for this on chromosome 10 by mapping, uh, looking for pieces of DNA that were actually missing from tumors of, uh, in our case, we were looking in breast cancer, brain, GBM, and prostate cancer. And we found this uh, region, and we were able to use this to bootstrap our way to identify a, a gene, because this was before the Human Genome Project was finished, and um, we didn't know where it lied. And this is some of the more detailed information on how we got there. Basically, we, we made a bacterial artificial chromosomes uh, that span the deleted regions in the different tumor types, and we used that to generate sequence data and libraries that allowed us to identify the transcript that turned out to be P10 that was expressed in different um, types of uh, human cells. Uh, and then we sequenced it and we found the homology, the, the phosphatases, and you can see these are all different uh, phosphatase family members uh, and the strong striking homology shown here. And here's the homology to tensin, which is uh, also uh, in the phosphatase family but actually lacks the catalytic amino acids. This is the first actual mutation in P10 that we found. We were doing uh, amplification of the early exons. This is the first exon that we identified. And you can see that this there's a deletion in the exon, making it uh, smaller, running it on a gel by gel electrophoresis, which created a frame shift mutation in that particular case. And this was our early sort of summary of the types of data we were seeing. We were seeing lots of missense mutations in the phosphatase domain and variety of inactivating, truncating mutations uh, throughout the gene. Homozygous deletions, that's how we map the gene to begin with. Those are genes, deletions where you're missing both copies of the gene. And we could see that these were being somatically mutated in a wide variety of cancer uh, and also in the germline, as I mentioned, in Cowden's disease and also other hamartoma syndromes. Uh, and those are in red, um, the hamartoma syndrome uh, mutations. And this is just an example of what it used to look like when we used to run gels. We used to pour gels and use radioactivity, and we, nobody does this anymore. But this is just to show you how nice and clean the data was. You can clearly see uh, mutations occurring in these different cases, um, and, um, and, and, and they map to the appropriate places that I was mentioning earlier. So in breast cancer, we were interested. Um, uh, uh, one of the features of P10 that's interesting is it can be involved in, obviously, if you can inherit mutations and that predisposes, predisposes you to uh, hamartomas, it, I didn't mention it also can predispose you to, but at lower penetrance, uh, uh, malignant tumors uh, like breast cancer. But, um, it, uh, but it's also very much involved in advanced malignancy, where we can see that it, in certain kinds of cancer, like prostate, uh, it's mutated like, let's say, 10% of the time uh, in a primary uh, prostatic uh, cancer. But uh, in advanced metastatic cancer, it's over 50% of the time. So, um, but in any way, in the breast, we were looking at loss of one copy, and you can see what we saw was that for chromosome 10 in DCIS, very low frequency loss, 
of, um, of P10, but in carcinoma, high frequency, suggesting that in breast cancer, at least in sporadic breast cancer, uh, it is the, um, the tumor, the tumor um, uh, uh, acquires this loss after initiation. So this is just some data taken from a PNAS paper where we worked with uh, Nick Tonks' group at Cold Spring Harbor to show that we could identify that it was actually a P10 encoded a real phosphatase. Um, I won't spend time going through the actual details of the data. And this is data showing us that in fact we had model systems we could study right away. This was a series of breast cancers. We sequenced 20 breast cancer cell lines and we found five of them uh, that had alterations in P10. Four of them could be explained by uh, looking at the exons um, and finding that they were mutated. One was a mystery at that time, but you can see that they, um, we can see much lower expression in these two that had missense mutations. And so we started to use these cell lines to, to query what happens when we um, put P10 back into cells. And we did this, this is a colony assay, a very simple assay where we express the gene in these different cell types. And we could see that we had a very profound inhibition from let's say 60 colonies to three colonies when we put the gene back in. And when we, we made a, a missense mutation that blocked catalytic activity of the phosphatase, we basically rescued the effect, suggesting or demonstrating that the, the phosphatase activity was really important for tumor suppression. And when we put the gene into cells, um, we could express the protein. And this is just a, a, a readout of cell death where we, the P10 could kill tumor cells that were missing P10 um, uh, through apoptosis and that we could re partially rescue this with um, an inhibitor of caspases. We also, this is just more data showing the same kind of thing by sub-G1 DNA and also that you can also see an effect on uh, uh, proliferation as well with a, uh, enrichment of the G1 fraction in the cell cycle. And I, I, again here, this is uh, an iconic image. Don't look at the actual data, but basically, uh, using different systems, uh, working um, with an uh, NIH uh, investigator, um, we, we show that P10 could inhibit cell migration in addition to its ability to uh, inhibit proliferation and uh, cause cell death. Um, the key finding that really put uh, P10 in, in some context physiologically was done by Jack Dixon at University of Michigan at the time. Now he's at UCSD. He's a biochemist, a, a, a world-renowned biochemist, who hypothesized that PIP3, that's the sub uh, which is made by PI3 kinase. Basically, this is PIP2 on the membrane. PI3 kinase just adds one phosphate to this substrate. PIP2, which is four or five, uh, the, the four and five position of the inositol ring or phosphorylate, is very abundant on the inner surface of the plasmic membrane. PIP3, which it generates, is very, a very low abundance. And um, that's usually kept in check by P10, which dephosphorylates um, this phosphate. And as I mentioned before, regulates this uh, second messenger system. So that was figured out simply by uh, hypothesizing that P10 could do the job and showing that if you made a PIP3 substrate, uh, P10 could dephosphorylate it very nicely. Uh, and that, that there's a variety of other controls were done. And this firmly placed P10 on this, this pathway, regulating AKT kinase, SX kinase, and cell responses um, downstream of, uh, in this case, they showed one tyrosine kinase receptor a reg that regulates PI3 kinase is, um, is the insulin receptor. But this is also the case for EGF receptor family members and, and uh, IGFR and, and many other uh, tyrosine kinase receptors as well. So for us, uh, we got into the game by simply showing that we could rescue cell death induced by P10 with an AKT, uh, which makes sense because that's act regulated by PIP3 on the PI3 kinase. And we could actually inhibit the phospho signal on AKT by simply adding P10 to cells. And this is shown right here. Um, and, th and this is in a cell line that normally has no P10 because it's mutated. And that together, along with looking at just metabolic labeling of the cells and identifying that PIP3 actually is regulated by P10, demonstrated that, in fact, this was, in our, at least in our hands, relevant to the cancers that we were studying. In parallel, um, to measure, and one of the, the really important things that uh, uh, laboratory uh, research has to do is we can't just study correlations. Um, correlations are always there, especially in the big data world, where you can always find something associated with something else. We had to actually demonstrate causality, where we just took the homologue of the mouse gene, knocked it out in the mice, and asked whether do these mice get tumors, um, and up or down vote. Let's see what happens. And basically, we did that. We made uh, mice that were heterozygous for uh, a P10 by knocking out the phosphatase domain. And in relatively rapid fashion, within uh, six months, we noticed that uh, many of the mice were developing these large uh, 
lesions um, or large masses uh, in, in a variety of places of their body, uh, they turned out in large part to be a, a non-malignant um, a lymph, node hy lymph node hyperplasias. Uh, but in fact, when we did autopsies on these mice at a year old and looked at different places in the body, that wasn't the only thing we were finding. We were finding many different kinds of, uh, of uh, um, neoplasia. Uh, with, with the exception of mammary carcinoma, which was an invasive disease, we were seeing many different kinds of um, uh, early invasive, non-invasive early lesions, particularly in the uterus. Uh, we saw um, tumors that were uh, in the, in the uh, adrenal medulla. Uh, we were seeing uh, in the prostate. And, um, and many of these had two hits, but some of them didn't, meaning that some of them had lost the wild type copy, but others had not. And this is the, and to see if this linked to the P. kinase pathway at all, we looked at the AKT activation marker, and we could see in some of the tissues very nice activation of the AKT signal, suggesting that this hypothesis that P10 regulated the P. kinase pathway, in fact, had some legs in, in a physiologic setting uh, in an animal model uh, that tried to, and this is, and you can see just, this is one of these early um, hyperproliferative lesions in the prostate that occurs as a result of P10. And you can see the lower levels of P10 in the lesion and the higher AKT activation uh, in, in the lesion. And this is just more of the same kind of data um, in the uterus and the adrenal medulla. Um, so basically, based on that, back in 2001, many years ago now, we hypothesized we could use our animal model to test if there was a drug that could somehow affect these different diseases we were seeing in the mice. And so we used Temsirolimus, uh, which is a rap rapamycin analog, which inhibits the raptor mTOR complex and S6 kinase, um, to see if this, which is, was known to be downstream of AKT, uh, was uh, potentially able to, um, this drug was able to potentially have a, a beneficial effect in the mice. And in fact, it was. We were able to, here you can see, um, it didn't change the phospho-AKT signal in our setting, but we could see block and progression. We could see, also see a re very marked reduction in, in the proliferation in the tumors. And here's just the block and progression data up here at the top. Um, another thing that we found that seems to be uh, really important, um, which at the time we didn't really recognize, uh, but it has a lot of therapeutic and uh, uh, toxicity implications, which is whenever we put P10 into cells, um, we could immediately, uh, I mean, when I say immediately, within an hour, um, start to activate a feedback mechanisms that would try to restore the pathway in the cell. So that basically the cell has hardwired to try to keep the pathway on uh, when you shut it off. Um, and so some of that in some instances can lead to uh, resistance, uh, mechanisms of resistance when you try to have therapeutic uh, effect when you basically inhibit this pathway. In other cases it doesn't. The feedback is always seen, but in some cases the inhibition and the feedback is not sufficient to override the inhibition. Um, anyway, um, uh, this is, uh, I, sh I talked about this a little earlier, uh, where um, uh, we were looking at LOH for P10, but in, when we were looking at P10 protein levels, we saw a very similar thing, very low levels uh, in ductal <laughs> carcinoma and the situ of loss, and again, um, a tendency of loss in carcinomas, especially in the ER negative uh, 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 flavor of the disease. And, um, the, the, and, and at the same time we were doing this, we were looking at, um, what was going on with, um, with the PI3 kinase. It had just been discovered, um, so uh, we'd been trying to sequence uh, PI3 kinase. It's a huge gene. Um, we were looking in the wrong uh, subunit. We were looking at the regulatory subunit, the P85 regulatory subunit. We saw very few mutations uh, in breast cancer, which, is, which was the model system we were focusing on. And then um, uh, Bert Vogelstein's group at uh, Johns Hopkins sequenced all the kinases in colon cancer and identified the PI3 kinase was mutated in about a quarter of colon cancers. So we decided to do, to do the same thing in a large series of breast cancers, and we found that the PI3 kinase is activated and mutated uh, somatically as an oncogene in a lot of different uh, breast cancers, about a quarter. And it turns out this is the most commonly mutated oncogene in breast cancer, more frequent than HER2 um, uh, mutation uh, in, in primary tumors. And we, we found, I'm not gonna go into this, but basically um, we, we found that a lot of the um, the tumors that had pediatric kinase mutations didn't have, P, had P10, so there was a mutual sort of uh, exclusive alteration. You don't always see that in, in endometrial cancer, for instance. You often see co-occurrence of P10 pediatric kinase, so there's no laws here. But one of the things that happened uh, while we were doing this is we decided to look at some triple negative breast cancers, and as you know, or you may know, 
Um, uh, BRCA1 in, uh, uh, mutations are associated with uh, uh, ER-negative breast cancer, uh, triple-negative breast cancer. And so we found that a lot of the ER-negative, uh, of the BRCA1 tumors were had, uh, this is the normal duct, this is the tumor, had much reduced P10. And we saw in some of the BRCA1 cell lines, actually the only two we looked at, that were P10 uh, was still uh, present at the genetic level, that we did fish analysis to, uh, with probes of different colors that flanked the P10 gene, and we had these two unexplained uh, cell lines. One of these was the line I showed you at the beginning, which had no mutation but um, had no protein. But you can see here when we did fish on it, the gene was completely broken apart. And you can see here on a metaphase spread in the normal, these two probes would overlap. Um, the, on the, the flanking probes would overlap, the uh, red and green. But here, you, there's a lot of intervening genomic DNA that screwed up the gene. And the same is in this, uh, the case in this other line. And we could map, when we looked at um, copy number aberrations within the gene at high resolution <laughs> using array technology back, that was available back in 2008, we could see that there was a, a, a signature here of a, a duplication that had occurred in each of the cases um, that indicated a, a re rearrangement at some point that had inactivated the gene. Another thing I want to tell you about is um, we spent a lot of time in, uh, you know, about 10 years ago now, uh, using gene expression profiling to see if we could see anything, an underlying signature that was associated with P10 loss in, in breast cancer and to see if that had any meaningful clinical information. And so we found a, a large subset of breast tumors uh, uh, that were um, missing P10 had an, a co-associated gene expression signature that was also seen in some other cases that still had P10, and that this was associated with um, uh, poor prognosis um, in, um, in the cancer. And, and this is probably partially through, um, only partially through the fact that we see hyperproliferation, which is a poor prognosis um, marker on its own in, 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 in breast cancer, but um, also partly, I think, also through the effect on the actual pathway itself. Um, uh, then, uh, th now I'm going to get into the weeds a little bit, so I've, I sort of give you some of the big picture that we know about. Um, but some of these things I think are interesting. This is um, this inhibitor of P10 we found uh, in 2009, published in Science, where we showed that um, in, in, over here, if you look on the right side, uh, we, well, first of all, we found a protein that bound to P10 by mass spec. Um, we showed that in breast cancer, and this is holding up in TCGA, uh, na you know, na national databases, um, that uh, high P10 cases tend to have high PREX2, and we found that P10, uh, PREX2 could inhibit P10 lipid phosphatase activity. And when we looked in uh, Oncomine, uh, which is a database of published uh, gene expression data from different kinds of cancer, we could see it was upregulated uh, in a variety of different kinds of malignancy relative to normal, and I won't go again through the details, um, but basically we could also see that PIC kinase mutations were associated with high levels of PREX2, and that in different assays, we could see, for instance, I'll give you an example shown here. This is the ability to transform mammary cells with PI3 kinase alone, and this with PREX2 alone. But together, we could clearly increase the level, the, the number of colonies that would grow in soft agar. Uh, and also, when we knock the gene down, we could um, do a few things that we would expect, which is in, since it we were thinking it would be an, an inhibitor, we get rid of the inhibitor, and now we lower the AKT signal. Um, and then we also lower proliferation in a setting where P10 is present, I mean, where PREX2 is present and P10 is present, and where P10 is mutant and PREX2 is present, when we knock it down, there was no effect on growth, demonstrating, um, I think, that um, this was, at least a large part of this was occurring through P10, the regulation of P10. So here, um, uh, you know, I showed PREX2 again as an inhibitor of P10, uh, which then, uh, which is also an inhibitor of the pathway, it's double negative here. Uh, and also you have PI3 kinase. So again, just, just to mention, you know, receptor tyrosine kinases are, are also, are already really good, well-validated targets. Uh, PI3 kinase, there's a large treasure trove of drugs being developed to target PI3 kinase. Um, and also uh, the mTOR family, we already heard about um, the Rapalogs, but they're already uh, in the clinic um, uh, in different clinical settings. Uh, people are trying to also develop inhibitors to other kinases in the pathway, like AKT. Um, and, uh, and, and one interesting aspect is there, this is an oversimplification, there's alpha, beta, gamma, and delta PI3 kinase, and some of these are, seem to be driving, some of these isoforms are very, um, we can develop drugs that are very specific to some of them, and in uh, and, and certain diseases um, like CLL, uh, uh, the delta inhibitor has been shown, looks like it's a very promising uh, drug. So the last thing I'm gonna talk about, how am I doing with time? Okay, we're good. <laughs> 
um, is this paper we published last year uh, uh, um, after arriving here uh, where we identified a longer isoform of P10. Uh, we call it P10 long, or it's now known as P10L. Um, but uh, basically, it, 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 it's an alternative translation uh, of, of the protein. So basically, the classical form of P10 starts with an ATG, COSAC sequence, makes 403 amino acid protein I talked to you about earlier. But we have alternative translation initiation can, be occur, can occur, and this can lead to this long form of the protein. Um, and basically, there's a couple of things when you look at the sequence that make you think, hey, there's something going on here. One, there was a, a, a predicted secretion signal at the amino terminus, and the second is that it had a polybasic sequence, which is known to be associated with cell penetration activity. And it's evolutionarily conserved among different um, mammals and vertebrates. Um, this is just showing that it actually can exist, the longer form. And when we knock out the gene, we lose both the long and the regular form, shown here and here and over here. Um, when we, um, this is, it's hard to see here, but I don't know if you can see this, but this is, we purified P10 long from bacteria versus P10, and we asked, um, whether it could have catalytic activity, and they're very similar. They're both phosphatase, lipid phosphatases, as you, you would expect. And we could also see that they both could inhibit the signal on the AKT pathway when we um, put them, in, when we transfected them into cells. Um, we, we looked at the signal sequence and we decided to mutate it um, and see if we could uh, s measure uh, effects on uh, secretion. But in the meantime, we looked at um, in serum and plasma and we f could find a P10 long in serum and plasma just floating in our blood, in normal blood, and we made this mutation and asked whether we could affect secretion of transfected cells, and we could, where the secretion and deletion mutant uh, wasn't found in, in, in the conditioned media. And then the last thing uh, that was really interesting molecularly is that this thing uh, can get into cells. So basically this is RFP alone, or a mutation that deletes that polyarginine sequence, which has much less uh, uptake. Uh, this is the wild type protein, which gets into cells uh, quite well. Um, and this is just some more kind of data confirming that. Um, and we so saw that basically when we did a dose response in the lower right hand corner with this protein, we could shut off the signal um, and actually ca cause cell death. And this is quantification of that um, cell death. And uh, it also could affect blood glucose, as you'd expect, uh, similar to what a P3 kinase inhibitor can do, although not to the same extent. And the um, last piece of uh, primary data I'm going to show is this. We could uh, treat mouse, uh, uh, with mice with tumors. This is a breast cancer xenograft model, and this is a glioblastoma a xenograft model. Um, and this is just imaging uh, data. And you can see we can actually, five days of treatment, uh, completely block tumor growth. And in fact, at, at day uh, five, we could start treating the control group and actually see tumor regression. Um, and then over here is the signaling changes that we see. You can see the large reduction in phospho-AKT, activation of cleave caspase, and some of this, this is an AKT substrate that's changing. So basically, just show you this sort of historic picture, basically, that I, is an overview of the things we found. We found it was mutated in, uh, uh, I mean, we, we found it was mutated in cancer, many different types in the germline. It can cause cancer cell death and cell cycle arrest. That's due to inhibiting the piastri kinase signal. The mice developed tumors with increased AKT signaling. Uh, um, uh, P10 expression is lost, particularly in ER negative basal breast cancers. Uh, we found that uh, P10 can cause feedback activation of the piatric kinase pathway. The mouse could be treated with a rapamycin analog effectively. Piatric kinase mutations were mutated in a high fraction of breast cancers, suggesting, and, and, and along with, there are other changes in the pathway. Now we think that maybe something on the order of uh, about 50% of breast cancers have some kind of alteration on the piatric kinase pathway. Um, and that P10 loss. Um, gene expression signature is associated with poor prognosis. Um, uh, P10 um, can be inhibited by the protein PREX2, which I didn't mention, but is um, highly mutated in certain kinds of cancer, particularly melanoma. And it's been shown that these mutations are oncogenic in mouse models. Um, and uh, and it's, I didn't get into what it does. It's a RACGEF. It's the most frequently mutated RACGEF, which is a guanine nucleotide exchange factor in, in the genome. And I mentioned the, the business about secreted P10. Um, this is just a, a cartoon from a couple years ago now, just identifying all the different drugs that are in development um, uh, uh, as of, um, that, that looking to, to intervene on this pathway uh, and, and different ways and approaches. And also, this is not gonna happen alone. We know from a lot of work already that a lot of these have to be done in combination. A lot of these uh, 
drugs that target this pathway are going to have to be targeted with, against other pathways in combination that, uh, for instance, a lot of people have looked into the ability to combine uh, ERK pathway inhibitors with PI3 kinase pathway inhibitors, and, um, and we are looking at, uh, looking at epigenetic inhibitors in combination with these kind of PI3 kinase pathway inhibitors. And, and there's just, a, 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 people are also looking at PARP inhibitors in combination. So there's a lot of studies trying to find combinations that can be used with this pathway to try to find uh, more effective therapy. That, that's not to say there's no toxicity with these uh, therapies. These uh, um, are very important on the uh, glucose uh, homeostasis, this, this pathway. So there's going to be uh, a lot of learning curves, and a lot of these drugs that you see here are going to be sort of like first-generation drugs that we need to you know, develop be better versions of. Um, but anyway, uh, that's sort of a summary. I just, uh, there's a lot of people that were involved in, in getting, uh, getting all this done. Um, the stuff I was talking about today, uh, um, uh, a lot of the work uh, for PREX2 was done by uh, Cindy Hadikoski uh, and also um, uh, Barry Fine, who's in the past member of the lab, and also uh, Ben Hopkins, uh, who, who did, was the first author on the, um, on the secreted uh, 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 P10 long uh, story I mentioned. Okay, uh, and, and also we uh, just acknowledge that we're, uh, um, we're um, also collaborators. We have a lot of collaborators at Columbia still that are, um, that are working with us on this, uh, so and acknowledge them. And um, up here, uh, these are a lot of past, past members that we've, we've worked with uh, in the past. Anyway, thank you very much. Absolutely. Often not maintained, and I think that has an, an adverse impact on, on people's career. A absolutely. Careers. Two questions that are related I wanted to pose to you, although I'm thinking of a thousand in this fantastic presentation. The first is, and they're connected, is I, I wasn't following the connection, part, partly because of my lack of knowledge between <laughs> this whole cell cycle, uh, phosphatase uh, reactive cyclic activity, and and autism. Where do we, uh, was that a spurious discovery, and how do we connect that disease with this sort of cell cycle based uh, function? The I, second piece, which is connected to that, mm -hmm. is uh, I was perhaps personally, because I'm a vascular surgeon, I was struck by the paucity of discussions on how very early in, in this cyclic event uh, we're not looking at P10 as it relates to arteriosclerosis and peripheral vascular diseases, which are seminal in cell cycle loss and proliferation, right. almost like a malignancy, they behave in a very similar way on the cell yeah. dynamics. We have approached it on the lower end of that long chain mm -hmm. with the sirolimus, everolimus, and that's the very end of, of the mm -hmm. line, but not at the P10 level. Why aren't we looking at that, or are we, and could we do more? Well, first of all, a P10 is very well expressed in endothelial cells. So when we look at, so we have a very good antibody that you can buy uh, from cell signaling that's a rabbit monoclonal that is, we've, we've validated and spent a lot of time and effort working on it and, and we know is validated by a lot of other groups independent of ours. Um, so I can share that with you. I mean, I think it's a good idea but by simply doing um, pathological and immunohistochemistry analysis on some of these lesions with this antibody, you could get, a, I think, a pretty good answer. Um, uh, if, 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 or, you know, you could, there, are other, there are other more sophisticated things that could be done, but that would be a very easy, inexpensive first pass look. I just don't, I'm not familiar Spirit with the literature. Extent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, um, but, but, but from the point of view, just seeing as it involved in the pathogenesis, to document that would be relatively straightforward. Um, we know uh, the, the pathway uh, is uh, very important in endothelial biology itself. Uh, because of the VEGF pathway being so, basically is a very potent activator of PI3 kinase, and the P10 can inhibit that. Um, and I didn't show you data, but we can, P10 long can block uh, VEGF-induced uh, uh, vascular permeability, uh, which is a very interesting point. And then to your point about the autism, I didn't go into it, but uh, as I mentioned, in just one slide about it, there's uh, a very long literature about the ability of P10 to regulate cell migration. And in fact, um, if you um, uh, knock out either P10 or PREX2, um, you get all aberrant branching of, 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 of neurons um, in, in the opposite direction. So uh, P10 loss causes this hyper branching, hyper sprouting phenotype uh, 
um, in addition to other problems in the brain, um, uh, in certain parts of the brain. And the PREX2, which is its inhibitor, if you, if you knock it out, you get this sort of aberrant, sort of reduced arborization uh, that's been reported by other groups that work on the brain. We, we don't do this kind of work. So I would argue that um, it's likely to be through this um, branching mechanism, which is actually not a lipid phosphatase uh, a mechanism. It, it turns out that it's through um, the ability, we think, of P10 to regulate PREX2. There's a, a mutual regulation that can occur. So I spoke about how P10 can be inhibited. But we think under certain signaling uh, contexts, actually P10 is actually involved in inhibiting the, the, the RAC activation that PREX2 can do, which is involved in the arborization, which I think may have something to do with the, um, the autism phenotypes. Now, it's also interesting to sort of, I hope I'm not too long-winded, but many of the mutations that are associated with autism uh, map to sort of these discrete regions um, in the protein that don't affect phosphatase activity. Some of them have, um, but they don't affect it. So we think that potentially um, uh, they're really, uh, there may be something going on there that's not lipid phosphatase dependent. Yes? Thank you, Ramon, for sharing your work. I want to go back to your in vivo studies with the knockout mice mm -hmm. where you were able to generate after a year some tumors, but they really weren't cancer. They're, right, they're right. They're sort of right. precursors. You right. talked about the two head mm -hmm. theory. What could, I mean, I may have. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, you what know. Right. Okay. Oh yeah. So I, I undersold that. Uh, I should have put more data in. So we haven't really been pushing um, this area, but there's a lot of other groups around the country have made um, uh, mice where you can t conditionally inactivate P10 in specific organs. Let's say you can instead of just in, instead of just doing it globally, you conditionally inactivate it in let's say the prostate. If you make a knockout where you hit when I say two hits, it's two hits being the first hit, uh, one allele of P10, 